Hey, hello, Snag. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good, Mark. How are you? It's great to see you today. Great. Good to see you, too. I uh, can't wait to hear about this new business that you're working on. In one sentence, the drop-in is a network of hourly workspaces targeted for the suburban markets. So we're actually breaking the traditional co-working model, and what we're aiming for is more of an on-demand or flexible workspace instead of services. Um, so really focused on daily and hourly use cases. Um, and the more we get to know about the suburban markets, people working from home, um, maybe not having the greatest work from home arrangements, we realize that there's this need for a work near home solution. And that's really where we come in. Is it like at all like a Starbucks where you can come and get coffee um, to discuss some mm -hmm. business opportunity or whatever? It's, it's, not, it's not like a desk or a conference room. There, I, there's like there's an in between size too. Yes, so we have um, hourly desks where you and I could walk in um, with every hourly kind of arrangement, free tea, coffee, and water. That's a very big part of what we're selling. Um, so you and I could go sit down and for 16 bucks total, we can have a cup of coffee in our meeting, a dedicated place. I could open up my laptop and show you something, use the internet. But it's, it's that experience that we're trying to left, replicate, right? The things that were uncertain in a coffee shop can we create certainty around that in our space? Okay, great. Love to go through some of the challenges you're dealing with. Any questions that you might have, it'd be great to uh, dig into it. So I'd say, you know, first and foremost, the most obvious challenge that I'll put out there is the mm -hmm. ongoing pandemic, right? And so we're, you know, battling both with people's sentiments around coming back to the workplace if it's the right thing for them and their families, obviously safety and health concerns, um, and just the continuous changing landscape of what companies are trying to do, HR policy. So I think from an external marketplace, that's one of our challenges, but I think also the opportunities, right? We're, we're really agile right now. Is the target customer a sort of self-employed person? Like maybe, maybe you could help explain why wouldn't that person, if they just need a couple hours or a day, if it's in the suburbs, work out of their own home? Maybe if you could talk a little bit more about that. So I'd say work from home. I'd say in, on any other day, about four weeks ago, my son and my CEO would be joining our call today. Three years old, right, running around at home. Um, and I'd say for most people, when they think about their work from home arrangements, they are likely not ideal. And anything ranging from maybe the lack of essential services or reliable services like internet, all the way through spouses, kids, families at home, and really not having that dedicated or productive workspace and time that they need. I think that being said to your point, um, it might not be that I need this space Monday through Friday, nine to five, right? It's really that daily and hourly, I need to go in meet with a customer, I need a Zoom room, I just need a day to work heads down. Um, and so that's really the use case. And then to your second question, you know, the target customer that we're looking for. So it could be a freelancer, a student, a corporate employee, a self-employed professional, really any professional or student that needs a dedicated space for a couple of hours. I can imagine the challenge just with COVID, we're training your customers to get comfortable working from home and not going to an office. That probably is a, is a nice headwind for you. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, similar to the hospitality industry, and I see a lot of similarity between hospitality industry and the co-working or flexible market, you know, in every industry right now that, that has space, the biggest thing is safety, right? Um, so everything from how we design our HVAC systems through the guidelines that we provide in our office, occupancy rates. And I think that's why for us also the daily and hourly aspect of our model is key um, because we're really focused on things like meeting rooms or phone booths, right? We're containing our guests, we're creating safer spaces for them to be productive um, and really thinking about that ongoing in and out, um, you know, customer and cleaning in between. I think safety Are you on mm -hmm. now, you own, do you own the spaces or lease the spaces entirely and then you know, carve it up by the hour and by the day, or do you lease space that's already like waiting in the market? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we're really in the process right now of leasing spaces. Um, in some cases, they're distressed properties. In other cases, they're, you know, right on the retail strip. And we're taking those spaces, we're renovating them, right? And actually turning them into flexible workspaces, which some of the questions I have for you, right, is around investors, right? And investing and getting that capital to actually 
create and develop and construct these beautiful spaces. Um, and then to your point, right, driving customers into the door uh, to really utilize um, our spaces and our services. On the surface, it sounds like I prefer, you know, the, the low cap backs, but you've chosen the high cap backs. I'm just wondering why. And, and yeah. We'll talk Absolutely. So um, prior to founding the, the, you know, founding the drop in, which is now like the high cap X version, I'd actually founded another company called Locus, which was exactly that, right? The low cap uh, CapEx model, which was really utilizing um, underused, underutilized spaces in hotels as a way to one, provide people with flexible workspaces to not have to develop those beautiful spaces ourselves. And then three, right, provide the hotels with incremental income and brand new daily customers that they otherwise may not have tapped or acquired in those markets. Where we went from locust to drop in and the pivot really occurred was one, a lot of those spaces right now are either we're unable to use them. Even when they do open, there's going to be a lot of restrictions around use. And what we quickly realized to go back to our conversation around safety, um, you know, those spaces weren't necessarily designed in many cases for safe working conditions. And so it's one of the reasons why we ended up pivoting to if we need to control safety and all the variables into the space, it might be easier for us to really create that space on our own. Um, now, obviously, that leads to real estate, and real estate right. is not cheap. Today it is, given what's happening in the market, um, but real estate's not cheap. But what we're thinking about structurally is, can we turn this into a franchise model, right? So our goal is, can we end up asset light, but really create something that's um, scalable and sustainable for the market and control the experience on site? Yeah, so the idea is to prove it with a space or two and then and franchise it out. So you're basically the platform, the technology, the know-how. Someone else would get the real estate and decide to open up a, one of these locations. Yeah, that I like that model. Exactly. So what are, what are you struggling with today? I mean, besides COVID, but in terms of, you know, where are you in the capital raising process? Have you launched your first site? You know, what does yeah, that look like? Absolutely. So um, given that we really jumped into our pivot about three months ago, um, I'm actually very, really proud of where we are today. We're right on the verge of securing our first two locations um, in New Jersey. So I should say I'm based out of New Jersey. We're really focused on the New Jersey market right now as many of our, the suburban communities that we're targeting are in transit villages. So folks that used to travel into the cities um, that no longer are or will likely be traveling as frequently as they were prior to COVID. Um, so that's really our target market. We're looking at opening two locations, one in January of next year and one in April and we are actively fundraising today. Well, why choose to do it in the suburbs? I mean, you have density in the cities and you have smaller apartments, less room, less offices, everything you said before about, you know, spouses, children, that sort of thing is even more so, I would imagine, in the city relative to the suburbs. So yeah, maybe talk about why, why the suburbs. Yeah, so I'd say, you know, a couple of things. I think one, the suburbs are an untapped market. Um, there are little to no kind of flexible co-working spaces in our areas. And for me, the competition out here is really public libraries, coffee shops, and frankly, your, your home space. Um, I think second, especially given our target audience, are those commuters of, of the world that are now really focusing in on their suburban areas, suburban communities. Um, they're actively seeking out um, these type of work-related services which are non-existent. So we see a, a really great opportunity to touch upon an untapped market and to really meet a demand in the suburbs that exists today. I'd also say for us, um, particularly in the urban cities, that's where really where you're seeing so many of the co-working players. That's where they've established themselves. Um, and, and we believe that if they continue to follow the trends, they'll also adapt to this daily and hourly services versus their monthly models. But would people like prepay for a certain number of hours? Maybe you get a little breakage there and you get cash up front just thinking about what might be beneficial. Exactly. So to your point, right, one of the things that we're trying to step away from or at least experiment with is not having a subscription model um, and really giving customers the ultimate flexibility. But that being said, pay per use puts a lot of variability into our financial model. And so we want to prepackage certain services um, so that way we can secure that revenue up front, but then give our customers the flexibility to use that package, for example, over a year.
So they use it when they need it, but we secure yeah, it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Prepay for a certain number of hours. I mean, cash flow is so key early stage in a startup, right? So if you get, get the cash up front, that would be great. You know, so as you can imagine, we haven't opened our doors yet. We don't have any traction. Um, but we've built our model on assumptions about what we know, right, about the industry and what we believe behaviors are. And I'm curious in your experience or as an investor or as a, someone who someone's investing in, how critical are those five-year models? How much value? Um, if, if investors, early stage investors at the stage you're at are asking about the five-year model, yeah. it's probably not the right investor, mm -hmm. I would say. I mean, at this point, early stage, you want to sell people on the dream of your your you know vision, zero this business, what it could become. Um, you know, it's a bet on customer demand and whether it'll be there, uh, and also a bet on you. So trying to to spend time with you, get to know you know your experience, um, how committed you are, how passionate you are, are you mission or mercenary oriented? Like those are some of the things I think about. So at this stage, it's it's the entrepreneur. It's how much passion they have. It's the vision. That's really helpful. I wish um, all of my investors reacted in the same way because we have the story down, right? And you know, I, I can see the larger vision and opportunity. But this was helpful. Right now, we've focused a lot on B to C, right? So us going out there and, and getting our customers kind of one on one. Where I see this, if I had to talk to you about kind of our vision, where we want to take the company. So when we have enough locations, I truly believe that we have the ability to do a B to B to C. And so what I mean by that is turning this into an employee benefit or employee reimbursement, right? As more and more companies out there are really rethinking their office spaces, their work from home policies, we see this natural opportunity to expand, right? Um, employee benefits to here's credit for you to work from home or, or build up your home office. And I would say, you know, at what point in time or what's that critical mass where, you know, we should start thinking about how we pivot, right, our revenue strategy to really target larger companies and, and see if we can fill a need for them? That's a great question. I would definitely start with B2C. I think prove the model, show that you're an, an operating ongoing business. I think it's hard to get B2B when it's a, they can't see it, touch it, feel it. Um, or know if you're going to be around or get funded and things. It's company, big companies move, move slower. Um, I think they'll probably want to know that you're more um, likely to be an ongoing business and that there's interest and they get to see what it looks like and the feel of it and things like that. So I probably wouldn't waste too much time like, you know, pre-launch or even soon after launch. I'd probably give it six to 12 months. And if it's working and you've got demand, you know, go out and hire a, a B to B person to to manage those relationships and try and take it to the next level. That's me. I, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule there, but probably I like the idea of being focused. Yes. And so going after two channels simultaneously when you're trying to do everything else is tough. I have one more question for you. Um, okay. is, you know, your personal experience with co-working spaces. So have you ever worked out of one, met at one? You know, what were things that you really loved, whether it be about the community or the culture or the experience, but just so curious about that. I, I've been in co-working space. I've never actually worked out of there, um, but I've been in, in, a, in a few, bunch of times. Um, I like the open spaces, the casual feel, the you know, that it doesn't feel like you're like just desks lined up in offices, that there's places to work that are more casual in nature um, from couches and benches and, you know, side tables and things. Uh, I, I like the community feel, being able to meet people, talk to people, um, you know, uh, and I think the, I think food and drinks is a big part of it. I, I'm not sure coffee and tea is enough. Um, I think I think people you know, it could be a destination if if you have, you know, good food and, and good drinks and maybe you can, you know, double the space uh, at some point. It turns into something something more fun at night or something. I don't know. Any yeah. way you can, you can get more leverage out of the space. Yeah, that's, I mean, event space. And, and to be honest, right, our, I'm hoping that our, if we get to a third location is this idea of space in a space, which can half of our space be a cafe or a restaurant or something like that and the other half be um, you know a flexible workspace and so you're getting both of those experiences in one place and having that end-to-end -end holistic opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited for you I like the idea of, of 
going against the, the, the trend, bucking the trend and doing it in the suburbs um, with the flexible workspace. I like the idea of, of taking one space, marketing it, trying it, see what demand is. If it works, scale it. I, I think you're, you know, you're in a good place. I think you should have no trouble finding seed investors that that uh, fall in love with that vision. So best of luck to you, Snag. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank good you for your time. It was really nice to meet you today. Same here.